Good morning. Welcome to Roaring Lambs Bible Study. We have a good turnout today. It's great to see everyone. And uh, we have a special treat for you today. Frank Ball will be teaching. As you know, he is uh, our Roaring Writer. He's in charge of our publishing program and does a, a terrific job. And uh, we look forward always to... <coughs> Uncle Frank. <laughs> and uh, next week, we're going to have uh, interesting lessons through the prophets uh, for the next, uh, till Christmas. And next week, I listen to Sally Boss, and uh, we're going to study in the Psalms of David all his prophecies about the coming Messiah, uh, Jesus Christ, who could come at any time. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. We're working in a new time zone today. <laughs> Maybe we'll learn something today. What do you think? Uh, we want to talk about the gifts and callings of God. And who hasn't heard about that before? And this is a wonderful season to talk about God's gifts. Is it not? Yes. Yes. Christmas time. Thanksgiving. But Thanksgiving comes first, doesn't it? And I wonder if maybe we need to thank God for our gifts. What God has already given to us. I'm not sure we're aware. Do we really stop and think about what God has given to us? I want you to know I'm quite good at telling God what I don't have. Mm -hmm. what I need and sometimes I forget to count all the things God has given to me and I wonder if I really know what I could use if I would just put it to use now if you're in that category you're not alone because I read that Moses didn't know what he had in his hand mm -hmm. and God had to show him what's that you have in your hand Staff, throw it on the ground and you know what happened it became a snake I wonder how Moses felt about that <laughs> then he reached down and grabbed the snake and it became a staff again that was just the beginning of God beginning to show what he could do through someone who was willing to do what he wanted didn't work out real easy for him because the first thing Moses had was an objection saying, I can't talk. I'm not a speaker. I can't. And how many times do we look at ourselves and say, well, God, I can't. I can't. And we forget the part that Moses tried to learn or, or needed to learn from God. God can. And we pull all this together as we begin to understand his purpose in what he wants to do we have heard I think all of us know God is what love you heard that before mm -hmm. and what's the opposite of that well Satan's the opposite of God isn't he well then Satan must be what Hate. Hate. hates the first word that we think of but I wonder if there's a better word I wonder if greed might be a better word. It had, greed would be the opposite of giving, and love is all about giving. God is about giving of himself. He's all about us experiencing his goodness and his grace and his love, and that experience is not the heart of Satan. Because the heart of Satan was to take God's gift and use it for himself. Oops. How many times do God's gifts become our own selfish concerns? And how much are we focused upon taking what God has given to us and see how God would use it? Because it is only in the giving of our gifts that we get to experience God's love. God's all about love and he wants us to experience him 
we do it through the giving. Not just, it's not all about the wrapped up presents. There is a verse that you have in your notes, Matthew 25, 14 to 18. I know you're all capable readers, but it's the story about what Jesus said the kingdom of heaven was like, like a man who was leaving and he called his servants and he gave three different servants gifts. He gave them bags of money with evidently some responsibility that they're supposed to do something with what they were given. And to one he gave five, to another one he gave two, to someone else he gave one. And what happened? Well, the five put that five to use. And lo and behold, earned more back. And then there was another man who had the two and he used two and he gained more back because he put it to use. And then the last one, the one who had the one, didn't do anything. And if you read the whole story, you find out that that man was in trouble because he didn't use his gift out of fear of the results. The expectation that God has of us is so great. We're not miracle workers, are we? And it's so easy to think, well, I'm not able. I'm not able. Yeah, what kind of bird's that? I'm not able. I'm not. It's capable and able pulled together. All right, that's. All right, we'll go on. <laughs> We're not capable. We're not able. We can't. Let's be clear about that. You know why we say that? It's true. We can't. And we have to get that part down so then we can release our gifts to what God wants to do. I do have a question about this story because I have seen a lot of different companies and individuals invest their assets. They have a business enterprise, they have certain things they want to do. I've known people commit themselves to ministry and it's just rather interesting how every year I read that millions of businesses and people go bankrupt. So I want to know in this particular story Jesus is really good about representing life in a story, and I see a piece that's missing here. Why didn't Jesus mention giving three bags to someone, and they took it and put it to use, and they came back and said, well, I'm sorry, I lost it all. Because that's what happens in business sometimes, does it not? When you go bankrupt, I don't know of anybody who went bankrupt and they told me, well, I, I, I really had a million dollars that I, I would decided to invest and my plan was that I would take bankruptcy. Nobody ever does that, right? No, no, that, that's a complete absurdity. Nobody ever planned to go bankrupt. Never, nobody ever planned to fail. So why in the world, if so many businesses and so many individuals fail, why doesn't Jesus include that example? Isn't Jesus a good storyteller? Couldn't he represent life? And I think the answer to that is yes in both cases. He's a good storyteller and he's a very good describer of life from God's perspective. And I think that's where we find the answer. When God gives us a bag of money, a talent, or whatever it is that he might place in you in an experience, an insight, or direction, and you use it, success is guaranteed. There is no failure in Christ. It can't happen. Now, your ideas may fail. You can go on your own way and do your own thing, and that might fail. But you know that God even has a way to turn that upside down and turn it into a success. And how many times have Christians told me about cases where they failed, and lo and behold, what, what they thought was bad really turned out to be good. 
But the key ingredient of this is whether or not we are using what God has given to us. I want to talk just briefly about this little verse, James 4.2, that I often hear people quote. And it says, maybe you've heard it before from the King James Version, you have not because you ask not. Has anybody ever heard that? Yeah. You of us have heard that. Do you know that's not the whole verse? We love to take out the little parts that fit what we want to do. Now, let me tell you what the sub subtext of that verse is and why we so often quote it. You have not because you ask not. The subtext says, if I just ask God, I get what I want. How's that working out for you? I'm not getting it to work for me. And I wonder why. I think because God is a very good parent. When I was a good parent with my three boys, I didn't give them everything they wanted, but I guarantee I wanted to give them everything they needed. And there is an important difference. And the context that James is talking about in James 4.2 is nothing close to saying you're going to get what you want. In my version of this, you have it in your notes, you want things, but you don't have them. So you plot and prey upon others to get them. That sounds like greed, doesn't it? Still, you don't get what you want because you're not asking for what God wants. And for as long as we ask what we want, what we can depend upon God to do is to give us what we need. So let's step back just a minute and say, is that right? I'm used to praying for my needs to be met. But do you know that Jesus said we don't have to do that? Really? He said, look at the flowers. God takes care of them. Look at the field. Look how God takes care of everything. Pray if you want to. I don't see anything wrong with praying for what we need or we want because God knows both of those. But the thing that we can depend upon is God giving us what we need. And I have an idea we might find more of God's working through us and giving more through us if we were giving more, if we were sharing more. And I don't mean that we just need to increase our donations or write a bigger check. That's not where I'm coming from. I'm talking about where it is that God has put you to recognize kind words when they need to be said, for you to be involved with people you need to be involved with and not involved with people that you need to back away from. And you only know that by what God is speaking to your own heart. So what we're talking about here in using God's gifts is a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Desiring gifts, that's a good thing. Uh, King James, 1 Corinthians 12, 31 says, covet earnestly the best gifts. And in the Greek, that word gifts is charisma. You've heard of charisma before. This is just this special speaking quality that I wish I had. Um, yeah, it would be nice. But what it really connects with is this thing inside of us that becomes what God wants. That's what we're looking for. That's not the direction we typically go. Do you know that? We typically look at somebody else and say, I wish I were like that person. We look at the pictures of beauty on TV and in magazines that are all photoshopped to look better than what life is. And when we see it on TV, they play the music that we don't hear playing in our own ears when we go through our own struggles. Can you relate to any of this? You know what we're talking about? God is the gift. So when we want to desire the best gift, the things that satisfy, it's going to be God in it. So Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, Jesus said, if you who are evil 
know how to give good gifts to your children. Let me paraphrase, don't you suppose God knows how to give gifts better than we know how to give? Sure he does. Am I the only one that wonders if God hasn't stopped just a little bit short on giving good gifts to me? I can think of things that would be better. And I begin to say, wait a minute. That can't be the way it really is. But if that's the way we feel, then that's the, that tends to be the way we act. And I'm wanting this to get down to the depth of our feeling to see if we can really trust God with giving us the best gift. And what is the best gift? Well, let's read the rest of that. You can be sure your heavenly Father will listen to your prayer and answer what you have asked him for. Oops, it isn't what it says, is it? God's going to give the very best gift, and this particular verse tells us what that very best gift is. What is it? Himself. And it is the working of himself through us. If he could give us a better gift, he would give it to us. But he wants the best for us, so he has chosen to give us himself if we will accept it. But to accept it, we have to abandon our idolatries, which is simply stated, treasuring something else more than we treasure God's presence. For that, we need to make a little bit of an adjustment and remind ourselves about how valuable his presence is. This next week, I get to speak about Thanksgiving in a special event, on a special early Thanksgiving dinner. And I, guess what? I get to talk about what we are thankful for. Guess what I am most thankful for? In the context of what we're talking about here, I'm thankful for God, his presence, and the fact that he can work through me if I'm willing to allow it. He will. But he won't do it like he does for anybody else in the world. Luke 24, 49 says, I will send the Holy Spirit upon you. So wait in Jerusalem until you are equipped with power from heaven. On the day of Pentecost, there was an amazing outpouring of God's presence like people had never seen before. And you read about that in Acts chapter 2, the first eight verses. Where were they? Traditionally, people think there were 120 people and 3,000 people who were saved, and they were all in an upper room in Jerusalem. Can you see a difficulty with that? The logistics of that is impossible. That cannot be where they were. They were in the temple. That's where all the foreigners were. That's where all the different people were from all the different nationalities. So let's try to picture the scene. Let's try to put together the picture that I would, as a writer, have to describe it to make it real. These 120 were in the temple. Now we have the next problem. These 120 people, there's a mighty rushing wind and, and suddenly something happens to all these people and they began to speak in these other languages. <coughs> have you ever heard 100 people talking at the same time? Mm -hmm. How good are you at hearing any of it? I don't care what language it is. Not happening, is it? But I believe this event really happened. If it really happened, let me tell you how, to, how it had to happen. Now, we've got a pretty good group here. Do you know that we have different tables set out here? And we're in separate groups. Now, in each of these tables, you can begin to talk to one another and you can hear one another. That's exactly what had to happen in the temple. Because that's the way it worked. 
when Jesus was in the temple, he would be in a certain spot and there were people who would gather around him and would hear him speak. But in this case, there were 120 people scattered across the courtyard as the Spirit of God was poured out and they began to speak a language they didn't know. Now do you see why people were amazed? And now you see why different people had different opinions about what was going on? Well, obviously, these guys are drunk. Now, I think that's hilarious. I think it would just be rather interesting if I could have a swig of vodka and speak Russian. That's just <laughs> not going to do it, is it? Uh, getting drunk doesn't teach you a language. And there's a lot of people, I think, today that, who can babble a bunch of stuff and it's not a language. This was a language that people understood. It's just my opinion. I can't prove this, but since I have the microphone, I can tell you what my opinion is. I believe that outpouring of the Holy Spirit enabled people to speak in languages that they needed to go to the missionary fields where they were going and they went to foreign lands where they had never spoken the language and could speak the language and could communicate the work of God and all the wonderful things that God did. I think that's what happened. <coughs> I think it could happen today. I know of situations where it has. So it's not that God was that way at one time and then suddenly he's not that way anymore. He's still a God that does miracles. And he might do a miracle in you. I know he will do a miracle in you. I just don't know what kind. And we make a mistake when we start thinking that my kind of miracle should match somebody else's. It never will. What we have to question is, how can I be more willing to experience God's miracle in me? So I want to read a little story or tell you a little bit of story about Agnes Osmond. You have it in your notes. I picked this up with reading a little bit of history, and I love history because sometimes it tells me something about reality that I didn't know before. This happened at the turn of the century, and back over 100 years ago, in fact, even when I was a kid, there was this religious tradition. Maybe some of you are old enough to remember some of this. We thought it was really important on New Year's Eve to pray the old year out and the new year in. And so we had all night prayer services, and I hated it when I was a kid. I was ready to go to sleep. We get to the church at 7.30, and it took forever to get to midnight, and we had to go past midnight to pray the new year in. Has anybody ever done any of that? You'd ever see that? I had it in my church environment, but evidently, this is what was happening back in the transition between 1900 and 1901. And this young lady, Agnes Osmond, was in a prayer group praying the old year out. And she was asking for the Holy Spirit power to work in her life. That's all she was asking for. Asking people to lay their hands upon her and pray for her that God would use her in the missionary field. What happened is not what she expected. She began to speak Chinese. She didn't know Chinese. The people that she was talking to didn't know Chinese. So how in the world was she be speaking Chinese? Evidently God showed up. When God shows up, things happen. And in this case, it was unusual. What more was unusual, this just wasn't some little inspiring experience where somebody says, hey, I've got some gift. This didn't end. She kept speaking in Chinese. And she knew what she was saying, but she was speaking in Chinese. Well, since this went on for days, word got around. Newspaper reporter said, well, I'm going to report on this. And so he interviewed her and as she was speaking Chinese, what can you, would you write down what you're saying? And she began to write down picture-like characters that were perfect Chinese. Really? That's what happened. Do you think that really happened? 
We can write a story, anybody can write a story and say it happened. I kind of think it did. Now I have a personal reason to think maybe so. And you don't have to believe my personal story either if you don't want to. But let me tell you what I know happened because I experienced it myself. I was invited to a prayer meeting when I was 12 years old. Nothing special about it other than the fact my dad was a preacher and I never turned down an opportunity to go somewhere with my dad, even if it was to a prayer meeting. So I went to a prayer meeting late one night. The church was closed. This was just a special prayer meeting where we're all going to gather together and pray. Remember how old I am, 12 years old. You know what 12 year olds do today? They're not all that worried about what's going on in church. And I don't know that I was either, but I was going to do what I was told. There wasn't anybody else in church except the pastor was there and a few people and they were going to pray with us and we're going to have a prayer meeting. Okay. So I was told to get down on my knees in front of this steel chair, and I did. And I can tell you only a little bit about what happened from there on. As I knelt in front of that chair, I began to realize, I don't know how. I look back on it, I do not know how. How? How could I realize this? I felt filthy, dirty on the inside. I don't know how any 12 year old would imagine such a thing. I wasn't told such a thing. There was no special teaching or anything about any of this. There was just this terrible feeling of how dirty I was on the inside. I began to cry. I cried uncontrollably. It was that bad. It grieved me that much. It hurt that much that I just bawled. And then immediately, suddenly that feeling was gone. It was like suddenly the clouds parted and the sun was shining and I was clean. As much as I was grieving before, my gratitude was inexpressible. Oh, how I wanted to describe to God my gratitude for his love and how much he cared for me. Two hours went by and I have absolutely no memory of that time. Explain that, I don't know. There are two hours of my memory that isn't there. And when I came back to my awareness and we went down and we walked out the door, I looked up at the clock and I couldn't believe it was one o'clock in the morning. How did all this happen? But what they told me was, we don't know what happened, but we heard you speak a language. It sounded like Chinese. Now, all I can tell you for certain from what I know is, I didn't do this. I didn't produce it. And we need to understand that whatever our gift is at that particular moment, we don't produce God's gift. He gives it to us, and he gives it to us for some purpose. I'm still trying to find out what that purpose is. Many, many years later, I've lost count of the number. There's so many years, and I'm still seeing God's purpose. I will tell you this, that what I felt on the inside from that day forward, even though I was still fully capable of being a stinker, when I was a stinker, it hurt. When I knew I had done something that wasn't completely pleasing to the Lord, that bothered me. So from that point on, I gained a sensation of what pleased God and what didn't. If you have experienced God in any way, 
you have that internal compass to say, this is the way I should go. Isaiah prophesied it. He said there will be a day when the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll say, this is the way, this is the way I need to go. Unfortunately, what blurs that way is our wanting something different. And we need to yield to whatever it is that God wants us to do. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, We dare not be like others who brag about what they say and do, ranking themselves by using themselves as a standard for greatness, which isn't very smart. So then Galatians 6, 4 says, Look at what you're doing for others and find satisfaction in knowing you have pleased the Lord and then you won't have to compare yourself to anybody else here's what I think about God's gifts and I maybe maybe you've rubbed elbows with a few other church leaders who say I have the gift of this or the gift of that I have the gift of wisdom or the gift of knowledge or I have the gift of prophecy or I have this certain gift or I have the gift of healing. The gift is the Holy Spirit. I know that. You need to know that. The gift of the, is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to work however he chooses to do. Do you remember the time that Peter and John walked into the temple and walked past the lame man that had been there for years? He had been there with Jesus when Jesus walked by many times and never once had anybody said, God wants to heal you. But on this particular day, Peter pointed him out, called to him, said, look at me. And the man thought he was going to give him money. And he said, I don't have any money, but I'll give you what I've got. Now, Peter, if he didn't have God leading him at that moment, to say what he said and do what he did, he was about to make himself out a complete idiot. But God wanted to, at that time, raise that man up and do an amazing miracle. We'll talk about it just in a second, but it was more than what we imagined. But we know what happened with the man walking and leaping and praising God. 5,000 souls saved, Scripture says, as a result of that testimony that God chose to do, but it started with the gift of the Holy Spirit in Peter and Peter yielding to the gift of the Holy Spirit to the point that Peter would say, silver and gold have I none. And then we saw God work. It wasn't Peter doing the work, but it was what God wanted to do through Peter. And it happened. Now, let's talk about the size of the miracle. Do you know how long a child takes to learn to walk? And then they learn to run, and then they learn to leap, and they learn to jump. And this man, for 38 years, had never walked. If you're laid up in a hospital for a month or two, you have to learn to walk. I have a friend of mine who was very sick for two years and was in the hospital for months and said, I had to learn to walk. And this man received strength in his bones, and not only did he know how to walk, but he could jump and leap and Instantly. praise God. All of that is describing the work of the Holy Spirit. But do you see how it works? Through Peter to the man for that moment. Now, if we want to build a religion around this, I will tell everybody, you can go out right now and go find the next homeless person on the street and say, silver and gold have I known, but such as I have I give to you. It isn't going to work. Why? Because at that moment, you won't have it. But if you do have it, you could do that. Do you get the point? It is our depending upon the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not depend upon us. Here's the tough part. We have to be satisfied with where we are, with what God has given to us, and use what we have. Many of us are responsible or feel responsible 
to give what we don't have. Relax, you don't have to do any of that. You only have to use what we have. All Moses had to do was use the staff. All he had to do is take one word at a time. As God speaks to your heart, just follow that. It is just that simple. Now, where it breaks down is when we start making the comparisons. Well, there wasn't anything special about what I did. No, and there never will be, but there is something special about what God will do. And you may not see the results, but there will be results. What you will get to do is experience the flow of God's love into you and out of you. Because I want you to know, every gift we receive that is not used is worthless. So what do we know? A few things at the bottom of your notes. The gifts we receive from the Lord are to reveal His greatness, not ours. Satan was wanting to make something great of himself. And we can have that urge as well. Greed will lead us in that direction. But I want you to know, if we do that, we sell ourselves short because God is so much, much greater. And by giving up our greatness for the sake of His greatness, we get to experience something today, tomorrow, and throughout eternity that is immeasurably greater than ourselves. That should be exciting to us because it's an eternal blessing for which at this Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving season, we should be thankful beyond words and need Chinese or any other language that we could stumble through to describe what the writer of Acts says happened on the day of Pentecost because it says the people heard everyone speaking what the wonderful works of God. That is what we get to demonstrate with our testimony. Secondly, the gift of the Holy Spirit working within us is individually unique. And underline this, not to be compared with anybody else. And really, not to be compared with who we were or who we're going to be, what we need to be concerned with is the present moment and what God wants to do with us right now. I know at this season, a lot of us are really concerned about what's happening in Israel, and rightly so. We're concerned with what's going on in the world, rightly so. We pray about all that, and rightly so. But if we're not careful, it's a diversion taking us away from the very thing God would have us do with ourselves at the present moment, which is nothing more than to let our light shine for us to hear and follow whatever he leads us to do. And comparing ourselves with somebody else's story is, as I said earlier, not very smart. Lastly, and we mentioned this already, but it bears repeating, the use of God's gifts come with guaranteed success. You can't lose. You just put God's gifts to use, whatever it is. The little things that you have, put them to use. Just be more sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit and see what God will do. And I pray that you will see enough to know that He's working. Because I can tell you that if you see God working, if you sense God working in your heart, and you feel God's love flowing through you, what God is actually doing could be a hundred times more than you will ever see. Just the few things that I might have said today, I have no idea how anyone here in this group might have been helped. And I have no idea, you don't even know how that might help you reach somebody else that could reach a hundred other people. Do you see the multiplication factor of God's work as he works in us, as we are simply willing to surrender our will to his will 
And that's where really the guarantee of success is. And that's where the real satisfaction of God's gifts are. There are many people who seek gifts, and when they get them, they're not satisfied. God is the single gift that has guaranteed satisfaction. He is the great reward. So now I need to open this up for a little bit of question and discussion and something you might want to say. Jim. So your story suggests that Agnes was monolingual, but she was still understanding English. Did she actually go to China as a missionary? Yes, she did go to China as a missionary. She sure did. That's the rest of the story. That's, there, there's more to this story. Uh, and I just got a snippet. I was, I really stumbled across this story. It was, it was amazing. And I think God has a way of working things out in ways that work and we never even expected. I was doing an editing job for a pastor friend who's retired. And, and he, he had run across this story and that was in his book. And I read it and I thought, well, this is amazing. I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. And so I had to share it with somebody else. So, yes, Jim. Uh, I don't know the extent of God's miracle, and the reporter or whoever wrote the historical record probably didn't know either. There's so much that God does that we don't see, and yet I hope that we see enough in this season to be thankful, very thankful, enough that we understand the value of everything about God's presence <coughs> so that we want to surrender to him more completely. I can always surrender more. That's what I'm always looking to do. Anybody else? Frank? Um, your teaching reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where Paul said, be careful how you build, whether it's wood, hay, stubble, or silver, gold, or precious stone. And I asked the Lord one time, what does that mean to me? What is the wood, hay, stubble? I don't want to mess with that. He said, it's what you're doing, even for me. Yes. And after I got over the shock, I said, okay, well, what is the silver, gold, and precious stone? And he said, it's what you allow me to do through you. Oh, I agree okay. with that. Mm -hmm. The value is in doing what God wants. That, that's where it is. That's where the treasure is. In uh, the 23rd Psalm, David wrote, uh, he guides me on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes. He wants the glory that we can produce because what we do reflects on his goodness. There is a verse that says that we are created for God's good pleasure. Have you ever heard that verse? Sure. I read that verse and I thought, that sure is selfish of God <laughs> to use me for his good pleasure. I want you to know that as I have gotten to know God so much better, I have under, I begin to understand the glory of his good pleasure. And if there was any pleasure that would that would reward us any more than the pleasure of being used by him, God would want us to have that, but there is nothing greater. He would give us something else if something else was better. So his good pleasure is a really good thing for me and for you. Let him have his pleasure in us because we're going to become a part of his pleasure and the experience of who he is. There's nothing greater. Anybody else? Well, let me close in prayer. Lord, thank you for the abundance of your love. Thank you, Lord, that your might is greater than any suggestion that Satan might have. And help us refuse any temptation that the world, principalities, powers, or anything might suggest to us that there is something more than your way and something more valuable than your presence. Lord, help us turn our hearts more wholeheartedly to you that we might surrender to the greatest glory and the greatest treasure available anywhere. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am a